the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear sisters, dear faithful, we have in the Gospel of today's Mass two magnificent examples of faith. The leper, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And the centurion, only say the word, and my soul, my servant, will be healed. And our Lord praises both these men with all his heart. They pleased him greatly by their faith, and he was able to bless them greatly because of their faith. This gospel is a reminder to us of how important our faith is to us. If we would save our souls, we need a strong, vibrant, living faith. How do we have that? How can we acquire that? Certainly, you might say, well, Father, we have to pray. And you're right, because faith is a gift, a gift from God. So we do have to pray. And if we don't pray and we don't have that contact with God, we drift from, drift from him and pretty soon our faith doesn't seem real at all. So prayer is essential. But is there anything else that we need to do? And I would say yes, much. That doesn't mean it's complicated, but much. We must, because the faith is a gift that grows within our soul, we must nourish the soil, so to example, for, so to speak, so that it can grow and grow strong. So what do we do? Three things. We want to work on the level of the intellect, the level of the will, and the level of our heart in the sense of free choices. Firstly, at the level of the intellect, we have to work to know our faith well. You see, the faith forms a whole. Everything ties together to make a big picture, so to speak, a picture that's harmonious and beautiful. If we lack knowledge of our faith, or if our knowledge is only superficial, that picture is only partially complete. And furthermore, it's blurred. So we don't see it in all its beauty or depth. The same way, for example, someone who's colorblind looks at a sunset, but he doesn't see what you see. He can't. Or someone who's nearsighted, who looks at a beautiful work of art on display in a museum, but he doesn't see it very well because his eyes are bad. He misses a lot. And so it is with our faith. If we don't know our faith well, we don't see it in all its beauty. Our understanding is shallow, and our attachment to it is weak. And furthermore, we're vulnerable to misrepresentations of our faith because we don't know it. And it makes of us all of that, that superficial understanding, makes of us, spiritually speaking, very fragile in our faith. We're like a tree with shallow roots and it might stand tall, but if those roots don't go deep into the ground, in time of storm, that tree can come crashing down. And in time of drought, it can wither up. It's only the tree with deep roots that's strong, no matter what the circumstances. And so it is with our faith. It's only the soul with a profound faith that will be strong, in the storms of life, the arid times of life. 
And so it's very important that we, we strive to know our faith profoundly. We can't have a just get by attitude when it comes to the most important thing in our life. We can't fall back on, well, I know it's the true faith and that's good enough for me. No, we have to know our faith. If we want to take advantage of the opportunities to learn our faith, whether it be a sermon, which sometimes might not be fantastic, maybe most times isn't, but there's something there for your soul. And little by little, like one brush stroke at a time, the picture of your faith takes shape and you come to understand it. And of course, it's not enough just to listen to a sermon or maybe go to the adult catechism class. That's excellent. You have to read on your own. And when I say read, I mean read things that are doctrinal in nature or talk about what that means then for us. Most Catholics, I would say today, if they read at all, they simply read the latest news. It's not going to help them very much. It might even hurt them because they might simply get discouraged. And if they don't understand how God works through human frailty, and throughout the history of the church has done that. They're going to read the news and say, can this possibly be the true faith? If that's where the Pope is, if that's where the bishops are, if that's where the priests are, if that's where the average Catholic is. No, we need to nourish our soul with doctrinal reading. It might be the basic catechism, like a book like the one by Canon Ripley, This is the Faith. It's more than just Q&A. It explains. It might be the tried and true authors like Father Matteo or Don Marion or Monsignor Knox or Archbishop Lefebvre. If we have the traditional Mass in this beautiful church, it's due to him. He saw clearly. His faith was profound. Read him. So that's on the level of the intellect. We have to strive to know our faith, know it well. And we have to make, now we're on the level of the will, we have to make the, pri the faith the priority in our life, the one thing that matters. Of course, that means taking the, the duties of our faith seriously, coming to Mass, receiving the sacraments regularly. And we don't want to easily excuse ourselves. The weather isn't so great. Well, if it's terrible, stay home. But if it's just cold, go. You're here today. It's a good example. And the same thing with the sacraments. Here we have to wait through a long line to get to the sacraments. God bless you for doing it. Or come on first Friday or come on Thursday evening. If we don't go to confession pretty soon, we can't go to communion. It's inevitable over time. If we don't go to the sacrament our Lord gave us, we have to make the effort. And it's not only a question of doing it, it's doing it wholeheartedly. Assisting at Mass, for example, half-heartedly will never benefit your soul. It only hurts it, in fact. We have to put our heart into the practice of our faith. And we have to avoid, this is still on the level of the, the will where the faith is the priority for us, we have to avoid any deliberate betrayal of our faith, even small such as neglecting to say grace in public, at work, at a restaurant. It's small, it's a venial sin, but it's a betrayal of the faith. We're afraid to show that we're Catholic. We're afraid to show that our God has done much for us and we believe in him. So 
seeking to present oneself in a way that is not Catholic online, for example, or at work where we sort of pretend to go along because we're afraid to stand out. We want to stay under the radar. It's, I'm not saying shove the faith into people's faces. It will never help them come to the faith. But live your faith. Don't be afraid to show I'm Catholic. And I'm grateful to be Catholic. It's precious to me. If we betray our faith in little things, little by little, our faith weakens. And eventually it disappears. We come to believe as we live. Most of you know the story of the Lord of the Rings. You know that every time the ring was put on the finger of the holder of the ring, that holder weakened. Frodo weakened over time because he put the ring on several times. And he found himself little by little under the influence of the evil Lord. And in the end, he would have failed in his mission were it not for Sam. We weaken in our faith when we go along with the world to get along with the world and we betray our faith to do so. We, little by little, we place ourselves under the influence of the Lord of the world, who's the devil. Christ is king. The prince today is the devil. And we see it all around us. We can't put ourselves in that. We can't betray what we're about in order to get along. So that's on the level of the will. And now I want to go, this is still the level of the will really, but we'll say the heart because it's more understandable. We want to surround ourselves with that which is conducive to a strong faith, by what we choose freely out of love. So here I'm not talking about scapulars and medals and statues, although they have their place. I'm talking about that which really influences us in our choices. So we make choices that really influence what we become. Two things, our friends and our entertainments, they impact our faith profoundly. We have to choose our friends wisely, cultivate true friendships, because they shape what we become. You know the old saying, show me a man's friends and I'll show you the man. Who a, cho who a man chooses to hang around with, normally it fits where he's at inside, number one. But more than that, little by little, he takes on the spirit of those he hangs around with. Their approach to life becomes his. And so we want to choose friends with a worldview, with a character that's in harmony with the Catholic ideal. St. John Bosco says, He that walks with the wise shall be wise. A friend of fools shall become like them. And that's not only in our everyday life, it's online as well. We have to choose our friends wisely. And that doesn't mean, of course, that we, we demand that if someone's going to be in our life, they have to be perfect. No, they have to care about what we care about. They have to care about the faith and family and God. Otherwise, little by little, we'll become like them. Choose your friends wisely. Choose your amusements wisely. There's another old saying, we are what our heart loves. Entertainment that we choose, the entertainments that we choose, reveal what's going on inside, where we're at inside, the nobility 
or lack thereof, of a soul, our soul. But our entertainments also, like our friends, choose what we become. They either ennoble us or they debase us. Healthy, wholesome entertainments, like fishing or hiking or playing a musical instrument or singing in a choir or working on a craft or playing volleyball, these are healthy and wholesome and they create a healthy and wholesome person. Whereas entertainments that are base or vulgar, and I would say base and vulgar, not only in the sense that there's vulgarity involved, but that they simply satisfy a whim or an impulse or a craving for spectacle or thrill. These things create a weak soul. So the video games, most screen time, most spectacle-type entertainment is not good for the soul. A little bit is like cotton candy for the body. It won't hurt you. But if constantly you're consuming that kind of entertainment, you're creating a very weak soul that will in no way be attracted to higher things and even less to God. So we always have to ask ourselves when it comes to our amusements, not is it sinful so much as how is it affecting me? Is that all I can think about? Our choice of reading, our choice of music, our choice of movies, our choice of games, all of that affects us. How does it affect me? And then we choose accordingly. Parents, very important here for you because you're responsible not only for your own choices, but the choices of your children. You have to oversee that. You have to help them. Your little ones love cotton candy. And if you let them choose what they want to eat, that's what they'll eat. And only that. On the level of entertainment, they love cotton candy too. And if you just let them choose whatever they like, that's all they're going to be nourishing their soul with. And you can't expect them to be drawn to the faith if that's the case. So we're on the level of the mind to know our faith, on the level of the will to make the faith the most important thing for ourselves, and on the level of the heart to choose so that our free things influence us for the good and help us be stronger, not weaker. All of these things impact uh, whether or not we have a strong faith whether or not our Lord will be able to bless us as he did the leper and the centurion. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.